So hi there again, Boone. Um, we thought maybe we'd talk about um, how what, we've talked in previous webinars about why some patients are more likely to develop long COVID than others. And that prompted us to then have a discussion about how in general we can look after ourselves um, and perhaps reduce our chances of getting complications from any infection or any longer disease um, and the, the, the general principles of health and everyday life and well-being. Yeah, Mel, so uh, you, you raise a very good point. And I think in the article that you uh, wrote on autonomic dysfunction in long COVID uh, in January of this year, you were starting to describe uh, some of the, the, the treatments when a patient had established symptoms of long COVID. Mm. But perhaps I could ask you, um, in, in your experience, what, what are the top tips for uh, a patient who has COVID at the moment and uh, in preventing that COVID cause of illness from becoming long COVID? Mm. That's a really good question. And the first thing to say is that we don't know an awful lot about this at the moment. So there, there have been no randomized controlled trials or kind of proper, properly rigorously studied um, things because it's such a new condition. So this time last year, we didn't even, we were just hearing about COVID. Um, but we certainly know, and we've talked about this a lot in our clinic and with a lot of our patients, we know about this concept of the blood pressure stat that Boone, you've talked about, where um, we know that when you're lying on your sofa for a week or in bed for three weeks feeling exhausted and not going about your daily activity, the amount of fluid in your body can become lower, your blood pressure can become lower, your body changes its way of, of coping with life so that you're running on a, a, a level of dehydration. Um, and that can cause problems as time goes on. And we see that some of the symptoms of long COVID or post COVID syndrome um, are associated with that. So running on a, a lower blood volume means that every time you stand up, you start to have palpitations and chest pain and lightheadedness and you might faint. So in order to start, in order to prevent that blood pressure stat or that volume stat from changing, it does make sense that if during your illness you maintain a very good blood volume of say your normal two and a half to three liters of fluid a day, that might prevent you from developing some of these symptoms of low blood volume later on. So one of the things that we often tell our patients is to drink plenty of fluid, even when you're not feeling like it, when you're feeling ill and you've perhaps lost your sense of taste or your sense of smell and you really can't face food, to keep, forced, not, to keep encouraging yourself to drink fluid, to keep yourself hydrated, because that can really help later on. And perhaps, again, if you run a low blood pressure um, to add some salt to your diet, again, you really might not fancy the taste of it if you've lost your sense of taste, but try and, and encourage yourself to do that. If you're someone that already has a low blood pressure or suffers from POTS um, or, or vasovagal syndrome, maybe your doctor's already prescribed you slow sodium tablets or, or salt tablets, which might help with that sense of taste. So fluid, hydration are key um, as, as they are. Obviously, always be a bit careful if you have underlying heart problems or kidney problems that you're seeing a doctor for, because that you, if you're on a fluid restriction, that might not apply. Um, the second thing is to, and this is really difficult because obviously I've not had COVID infection, so I don't know what it's like, but to maintain some element of being mobile. So even if it's just a matter of getting up and going to the toilet or going to your kitchen or walking around your house a couple of times a day to keep your body used to that sensation of standing up. And we know, Boone, from previous webinars that we've been saying that we are bipedal animals. So we're, we're supposed to be on our feet most of the time. So when we're lying in bed or on our sofa um, for days on end, our body forgets the ability to do that really complex mechanism standing up. So gentle exercise, and that is the key. I wouldn't even call it exercise, but gentle mobility of just doing what you can little and often as, as often as you can, and that will help your body regulate. One of the third things is, is just the general principles of looking after ourselves in, in general. Often we forget about this at the best of times. So even in good health, we might be running a deficit on our sleep. Um, we never get around to exercising quite as much as we want. Um, perhaps to deal with the stress after a long day at work or a bad week, or if you're stressed about COVID, drinking alcohol, which again is a dehydrating 
a sort of element. So just thinking about those general principles, which you might not even be close to thinking about with a COVID infection, but making sure you get enough sleep, you keep your rest, um, you eat well, so nutritious foods, and again, a lot of patients I've seen just cannot stand the thought of food because of this, the sense of taste, but encouraging yourself to have high energy, nutritious foods throughout, and these, these can help. Good, Mel. Th those are very, very good points. Let me uh, just share some of the experience that I have. Salty water in particular can be very challenging for patients. Mm. And sometimes I, I would advise them to buy the athletic isotonic drinks, which can mm. be bought from any health shop online. Uh, and these are things that you drop like a Barocca, but something like a Noon, N-U-U-N tablet or ORS that you drop in a 500 ml glass of water and it fizzes up and it's it tastes quite pleasant and it does have some electrolyte replacement. So I think that can be a useful tip uh, for, for patients to just maintain the hydration aspect. Now, do you, do you have any uh, thoughts on uh, nutraceuticals or, or vitamins that patients might want to take uh, in the phase of illness? Mm, that's a good question. Again, there's a lot of kind of a lot of excitement at the moment about uh, different vitamins or in particular vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D deficiency, so people who have a, a low level of vitamin D in their everyday life, um, may not do as well in the, when they're admitted to hospital. Um, they don't do so well if they've got vitamin D deficiency and vitamin D supplementation. So having high doses of vitamin D is something that we now give up in patients in hospital on the first day they arrive because we know it's associated with a slightly better outcome. Um, it's a controversial topic and a lot of, uh, you know, there's, there's this age old medical debate about whether or not taking vitamin D on a daily basis is good. But what we know is that in Britain, where we work and in London, um, most of us are vitamin D deficient because we just don't get enough sunlight. Even if you um, spend all your day outside, most of us are covered up. So only our hands and now even our faces are covered. Um, we're not getting that level of sunlight that we need to have good vitamin D levels. And so taking a vitamin D supplement um, is certainly helpful in preventing coughs and colds, but it may well have further benefits. Um, again, particularly in some of the older patients that I see, it can help your strength, your balance, it can prevent you from falling. Um, and so I would say that taking a vitamin D supplementation, say from Boots, or there's a very nice spray that you can put under your tongue that tastes nice. It's um, you can get it from Holland and Barrett or, or on, uh, over um, on the internet. Um, and it, um, it's just, you can do it after you're brushing your teeth in the morning or before, and then you get your vitamin D and that, that can help. Thanks, Mel. Um, I mean, it's certainly uh, very reassuring to hear that because I've, since COVID started, started to give vitamin D drops to both my children, myself and my wife. So mm. it's, it's, um, it's a thesis that I fully believe in. And I think vitamin D is a great immune modulator. I think there is another great, often um, ignored immune healer and modulator, which is called sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, I, w I wonder whether you can talk more about sleep and the importance of sleep and immune regulation. Yes, so we know increasingly now the importance of sleep. And I think it's in a modern day life, 2021, when we're all very busy and very um, important, it's one of the things that we think we can do without. Um, and sometimes even a boast that you only need four hours sleep or six hours sleep a night. But we know that the average human, um, and, uh, you know, with, with very, very rare exception, needs between seven and nine hours sleep. Um, and you'll know what you need. So I need eight hours on the dot. If I have any less than that, I start to feel unwell. Um, we know that if you, we know that if you go for one night without your your set sleep point, you will start to underperform the next day. So whether that's high level decisions or complex decisions or just feeling well in yourself, you won't be doing so well. We also know that if you go for two nights without your sleep, you lose the insight to recognize that you're tired. So you then start to think, oh, I'm fine. I can live on five hours sleep a night. And then you, you go on. But we know that it increases your risk of dying early. Um, it increases your risk of all sorts of cardiovascular diseases. Um, other, there are theories about other conditions like dementia. Uh, these are obviously over very long terms because your brain doesn't have the ability to clear its toxins on a daily basis. So when we sleep, a lot of our the toxins in our brain and the waste products get cleared through the spinal fluid 
And if you don't sleep, then that doesn't happen. So the toxins can build up. And again, you're much more likely to pick up infections and stress. And I know, um, Boone, when we've been talking about, say, when we are um, have a couple of days on call or staying up late to burn the midnight oil, um, you get get mouth ulcers which is your sign to yourself that you're not looking after yourself i start to get migraine headaches um and again it's, it's it's something that we think is very important to listen to your body and to get used to listening to your body when you're and our bodies are quite good at telling us when they've had enough and when they need a break um yeah, and so, yeah so my my uh, uh kind of way to tie this into the autonomic function or dysfunction is that sleep is one of the situations uh, in which on a 24 hour or circadian basis, you're really finally going to be able to dial down your fright or flight response and increase your rest and digest or the vagal response. And mm. that is a great healer because the vagus is the, is the nerve or the, that part of the autonomic nervous system called the parasympathetic nervous system that really does rest and rejuvenate and digest. And so if you're denying your body every day sufficient rejuvenating time, then you, you are going to be, I think, putting yourself at, at greater risk. And, you know, there's a chicken and egg concept where if you're so fatigued and tired and irritable because you've got so much fright or flight, that in itself can mm -hmm. impair your ability to sleep. You might be tossing and turning, being completely fatigued, mm -hmm. which is one of the very difficult symptoms that my patients explain to me typically in long COVID. Now, during COVID, I think it's also difficult to sleep because you're coughing and you have a temperature and you feel unwell. So this kind of focus on sleep uh, or sleep disturbance may well, in my opinion, be one of the critical components that really reduces your autoimmune regulation and sets up this dysautonomic process. And, and how so that, do you, Boon, tell your patients to get a good night's sleep? say when they're so, in, in COVID or in the post-COVID phase? Yeah, so it's it's tough because I uh, here, you know, I build on my experiential learning, which is my own experience when I'm stressed out about a deadline. Yeah. And I think about the strategies that I can adopt to really switch off my mind. Because one of the things that you find looking up at the black ceiling uh, because in a dark room is that your mind is just going all over the place, your job, mm -hmm. your family, your security, the COVID, and whether you'll ever recover. And one of the great distraction techniques for me personally is reading uh, in bed. And uh, so I can take my mind and defocus on the thoughts that are coming in. The other great thing that I've started to do recently is meditating. And when you meditate and you focus on the breath, particularly this form of breath meditation where you're just thinking about the air coming in and out through your nose into the depths of your lungs and then out again, in again, and slowing the breath down to a five or six second breath pace for 10 minutes and observing the thoughts as they come by for what they are, which are thoughts and not really thinking or ruminating about the thoughts itself, but taking an outside view. So for example, you are now outside looking at yourself and these thoughts floating into your brain. And then you recognize that those are thoughts and then you let it go. You say, okay, this is a negative thought. I'm focusing on the breath. I've seen it, I've checked it, I'm gonna let it go. And then the next thought will come up. And this form of breathing can really, really activate the vagus and downregulate the fright or flight. And the more your focus in your mindset or mindfulness breathing is what I would call this, the more at ease you become over the 10 minute meditation period. So I meditate for 10 minutes every night before I sleep in, in that very process, just lying in bed, breathing in and out and observing my thoughts. Mm. Um, and in the morning, I try and do that too. Uh, mm. So these are two anchoring points before you sleep and after you wake up that can really set the tone for the for the next day yes uh, and so and i think that's a yeah that that would be my top tip for sleeping well that's very clever so that's both um your kind of your your thoughts and controlling but it's also setting your vagus nerve or your parasympathetic nerve um your parasympathetic nervous system up for for the day and uh, in sort of putting us into a more calm way. And what I suppose what you've been talking about is good sleep hygiene in general. So um, avoiding screens before you go to bed for a couple of hours, trying to get off the mobile phone, 
um, avoiding things like alcohol or intense exercise just before you go to bed can, can all help. And then, as you say, slow down and embrace your rest and, and digest system. Boom, so, that, that, so that was very good, Mel. I mean, if, if I just wanted to recap on the top tips to avoid uh, COVID from progressing to long COVID, and you know these are these are not necessarily uh, very strongly evidence based, but but our advice, given our limited experience we have now, is to a increase your fluid intake and make sure you're hydrating even when you don't feel like it. Number two, to have more salt, particularly if your blood pressure measurements are quite low or low normal, and how much salt? Maybe one to two teaspoons. If you can't take salt, then take an isotonic drink replacement. Number three, uh, we talk about the importance of sleep, which is a key thing, and setting your, resetting your expectations, number four. And then you mentioned a little bit about vitamin D. Um, is there anything else to add to that list, Mel, as a top tip? No, and I think the other thing we've been talking about is just being kind to yourself and saying, well, and, and pacing yourself and saying, I'm not expecting to be completely better by Monday. Um, this might take weeks and, and just accepting that and, and listening to your body. So that's a very good point to end. We set an expectation so we don't have an expectation gap, which can only lead to disappointment. So we expect that our recovery will be slow and we then act in a way uh, that uh, allows that recovery to happen without overcommitting ourselves. And as you say, being kind to ourselves. Thank you, Mel. That was extremely helpful. Thank you, Boone.